Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining in today. I'm joined today by Dr. Samuel Karaf and Dr. Matthew Hadfield. I'm Joe Kalis. I'm an ambulatory oncology pharmacist with the UC Health System in the Front Range of Colorado. So I'm based in Colorado Springs. But here today with my colleagues to chat a bit about esophageal cancer and specifically try to spread some awareness for esophageal cancer month. So setting a bit of a table for that, I know that, you know, if anybody out there is familiar with the SEER database that the government puts out, there's about 21,000 folks on average who are diagnosed with esophageal cancer each year, and then about 16,000 deaths from esophageal cancer each year. It's certainly one of those cancer types I've seen in my practice where outcomes are definitely not where we'd like them to be. But we've had some recent research advancements, recent treatment advancements that I think bear mentioning. So keeping that in mind, wanted to post some questions to my colleagues here. I know, Matt, you had mentioned talking about earlier ages of diagnosis for, for esophageal cancer. I wonder if you could shed some light on that for us. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think Sam and I were just talking about, uh, you know, an epidemiological study where esophageal cancer is kind of following the trend of colorectal cancer, where we're unfortunately seeing the diagnoses in, in, in earlier uh, ages. Um, and I think, you know, the unfortunate thing about that is we we really don't know why. I, I think it's it's a little bit alarming that now in lung cancer, esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, we're, we're seeing earlier ages at which people are getting diagnosed. And, 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 you know, you anecdotally hear that it's not just patients who have risk factors. And it's important to mention risk factors, because I think even though we're, we're specialized in oncology, it's, it's, it's good to always talk about just preventative uh, health care. And, and, you know, obviously alcohol use and tobacco use are, are risk factors for esophageal cancer. And uh, I know, uh, Sam, you're going to talk about uh, Barrett's esophagus a little bit, but, um, you know, we don't know why. Like, we, we don't know why all these patients uh, at younger ages are, are, are developing these, you know, is it, uh, you know, something to do that's uh, a toxin or, or carcinogen in, in, in food is an environmental exposure is it something else um, so it's, it's alarming and I, I think you know while we're always excited about new novel therapeutic treatments uh, it's a very disturbing trend uh, across now multiple cancers that you know I think we need a lot more attention on yeah I couldn't agree more because I think there's been a lot of press lately about increased colorectal cancer awareness especially with I think it was actor Chadwick Boseman who had passed away from colorectal mm -hmm. cancer at a very young age. And certainly unfortunate, but I'm I'm there with you, Mickey. We can speculate about environmental exposures, but I'd like to think that the general workplace has gotten at least a little safer since our parents and grandparents' generation. So it, it does seem that there's something else out there, whatever it is. And Sam, I know Barrett's esophagus can play a role as a risk factor, but what, what information did you come across there? Yeah, I, I thank you both again for this discussion. I think it's like we alluded to a little bit less discussed in the media as it relates to other larger um, or more prevalent cancers, I should say, like lung and colorectal. But the rise in esophageal cancers is definitely worth mentioning and definitely worth something discussing at length as we will today. Um, I, I think the, the points made so far are very important, right? We know that there are environmental factors for a lot of things. On this forum, we've addressed things like air pollution and lung cancer, um, high, um, rather low fiber food diets and colorectal cancer. But we can also kind of talk about some known um, environmental or maybe risk factors associated with esophageal cancer. So we can just go back to our pathophysiology days in our training. And we remember that the esophagus is that long tube from the mouth to the stomach. And it has various sphincters, but really the lower esophageal sphincter is very concerning as it relates to some epidemiologic changes we're seeing. And specifically what I'm referring to is the rise of obesity that we're seeing both within the US and worldwide. Indeed, just a few weeks ago, there was a large uh, epidemiologic study that was conducted internationally. And it looked at the increased age standardized death rates as well as prevalence of esophageal cancer as it relates to obesity. Why is this? Remember that lower esophageal sphincter is uh, within a vacuum or a cage, which is the thorax. And when there's increased pressure for things that um, kind of add to that thorax, whether it be obesity or other sorts of cardiopulmonary issues, it leads to greater reflux of those highly acidic gastric contents into the esophagus. 
So of course, when we have uh, uh, conditions like obesity or GERD that are at play and they increase in terms of prevalence or lower esophageal dysfunction, we can imagine that inflammation increases in that lower part of the esophagus. And indeed, we are seeing rises, which are frightening in terms of pre-malignant conditions like Barrett esophagus, also known as that esophageal dysplasia, that is a precursor to full out, usually esophageal adenocarcinoma, rarely squamous cell carcinoma in that part of the esophagus, and related tumor types like gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma as well. So this really just goes back to our ABCs of training, right? We know that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But really important to kind of hammer home the fact that it's not just cardiovascular disease that we're worried about in terms of healthy lifestyles, it's cancer. And really, um, we see this case very clearly with the uh, increasing rates of Barrett esophagus, esophageal cancer, GE junction, et cetera. So something very worrisome and something that's worth discussing um, with patients whenever possible. You bring up excellent points. You know, we, we know that obesity is a risk factor for many different types of cancer. It's actually... One of the first discussions I have with my students and residents of, I, I try to break it down somewhat simply in terms of like the more cells there are, the more chances there are for something to go awry. Thinking about esophageal dysplasia, Barrett's esophagus, the way that I understand it is you, you've got some of that leaky valve in the sphincter, the stomach acid refluxes up into the esophagus. Is it that the stomach acid's directly harming those you know, squamous cells or the ones lining the esophagus and that's where some of the risk for cancer comes from? You know, it's a really important question and it would seem so intuitive, but believe it or not, the cat is not out of the bag just yet. What do I mean by that? We know that when we look at the molecular changes related to esophageal cancers, it varies by population. In fact, we've seen, especially with related tumors like gastric adenocarcinoma in populations such as Japan and other East Asian countries, there are specific molecular signatures that are not translated when you look at other populations such as the US and Europe. So while it's a convenient hypothesis, it's definitely worth testing and we'll see how it goes. I, of course, it makes a lot of sense and something to discuss with patients, but on the research side, I think we have a long way to go in terms of identifying targets in that pathway that we might be able to block. It, it's not as clear cut as that APC, um, et cetera, pathway we have in colorectal cancer. We have a lot to learn for esophageal and related gastric cancers. Yeah. One of, one of my favorite lines is when I get a question is I can always answer it with, I need more data or <laughs> it depends. Yeah. And, and, and keeping that in mind, like you talk about the diversity in cases and in pathology, I think some of that relates to the differences we've seen in treatment. You know, we've had some recent advancements with the uses of immunotherapy in esophageal cancer and gastroesophageal junction cancer, where traditionally we haven't seen as good of response rates with immunotherapy compared to other disease states. Just the gastrointestinal tract doesn't seem to have the same level of response. But is that is immunotherapy in these cancers something you've used in practice, Matt? Uh, you know, I think it, so I, I think the story of immunotherapy is is the feel good story, right? I mean, Immunotherapy was thought to be dead coming out of the 90s. We we discovered ipi, nevo, melanoma. You basically functionally cured people with metastatic melanoma, giving them, some patients, the ability to live many years. And I don't know that that success story has panned out as well with other cancers. I mean, certainly it's made advancements like in non-small cell lung cancer without a driver mutation. Mm -hmm. You know, you double overall survival from one year to two. But I think when you get into esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, gastric adenocarcinoma, I mean, you're really looking at like nuanced populations that have mismatch repair, protein deficiency, or, or micro satellite instability high, which is only a certain percentage of the, the patient population. So I think, while in my opinion, the only real way to get long term durable responses for any cancer, including esophageal cancer, is that you need some type of immunotherapy T cell priming response to, to propagate that. I think. We have not at all figured out, you know, how to make, you know, the you hear this all the time, the quote unquote cold tumors hot and how, how to actually, you know, start an immunotherapeutic response. I think that's very much the case of esophageal cancer. And I think, you know, I, I always have to mention immunotherapy toxicities. I think when you're starting to look at things like esophageal cancer, which is a surgically resectable cancer in earlier stages of disease. Um, we're going to start trickling these therapies more and more into neoadjuvant indications. And we have no ability to determine who's going to, um, you know, respond, not respond. We don't have any idea who's going to have a severe toxicity versus a mild toxicity. Um, and we're still kind of in the early years of immunotherapy. I mean, the FDA approval for IPI was in 2011. Um, it's not as if we've been doing this for decades. So I think 
uh, there's a lot uh, to be hopeful about, but I, I, I do think that um, it's, it, you know, especially in GI malignancies, we just haven't had the success that we've had in like melanoma or renal cell carcinoma, where you, you're getting these, you know, exquisitely immune sensitive cancers responding very, very well to checkpoint inhibition. It uh, just hasn't panned out the same way. And I think we have a lot to, to figure out in terms of a drug development standpoint. Yeah, totally. Just the, the immune responsiveness just isn't there. You know, maybe a drug comes up in the future where we can, like you said, make a cold tumor hot, but it still doesn't solve the issue of the increasing numbers of patients who are, are getting these malignancies. Yeah, yeah, I think that like, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's innate immune agonists that may function really well, like, you know, in very NK cells and, and, and TR9 agonists and things that could maybe do that. But to Sam's point, to big, piggyback off that, I mean, we could talk about drug development all we want, but I mean, we really should be talking a lot more about how to encourage healthy eating and, and, and smoking cessation. And, and, you know, because we really are going to just prevent a lot of these cancers if we can, you know, make impacts there. But unfortunately, especially in oncology, we don't, we don't see patients that have cancer. So it, it's important to raise awareness around that because you can, you can really make a lot of progress just in prevention. Oh, 110%. It's one of those thoughts I have often, like I'll see patients in clinic and teach them about their drugs and side effects and so forth. And we'll always, a lot of them will ask about, you know, what dietary changes should I make? Or tell me I've made these lifestyle changes. And I'm like, that's fantastic. But you think back, I'm like, okay, it, it might have been a little bit better if 10, 15, 20 plus years ago, some of those yeah. changes were implemented. And then who knows if things would have turned out differently, but I think it's never too early to start on some of those lifestyle changes. And to be honest, we, we know very well from caring for the you know, patients, even if they did make changes and unfortunately still were diagnosed with cancer, the healthier you are, the better you're going to respond to treatment, do well during treatment. I mean... We talk about, I don't like the term performance status because I think it, it kind of sounds like you're at like the combine talking about like draft picks, but, um, yep. and I don't think patients like having themselves stratified in performance status, but it's true, right? I mean, if, if people are eating healthier, they're exercising, they're trying to live a healthy lifestyle, they're going to tolerate therapy better. So um, even if it's not just preventative from a cancer standpoint, there's a lot of benefit there and it's, it's, it's a hard thing to, to really stress. Is there anything specific that you recommend to your patient, Sam, or general counseling points when you're seeing these folks? Yeah, plenty. But before I get to that, I just want to piggyback off one of the treatment points. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think we're all kind of hoping to see significantly improved outcomes when it comes to the application of therapies like nivolumab and pembrolizumab and esophageal and related cancers. I think what's exciting is our neighbor downstairs in the stomach, we have this new target, Claudine 18, which we can now target with new therapies. We're waiting to see that kind of available on a larger scale. Um, and then we also have the recent tumor agnostic approval of inher 2 for basically any solid tumor with high expression. So these are things that we should keep an eye on. But but yeah, I, I think with the the amount of research in terms of drug development and trials that's needed to advance that needle significantly, we still have a long way to go. In terms of the prevention piece, I, I think we've touched on a lot of it already, but basically we know in a lot of tumor types that um, complementary uh, interventions, whether they be diet related, exercise related, mindfulness, et cetera, have great efficacy. We, I think probably have the strongest data in breast cancer, but we see it in a lot of related tumor types as well. So kind of what we're all alluding to, I almost uniformly recommend the Mediterranean diet, unless there's some sort of um, maybe like personal contraindication, religious, whether uh, something like that is at play. Um, and then I recommend general USPSTF um, activity guidelines. We're really trying to hit that 150 minutes a week of some sort of like low to medium intensity exercise, and then try to do other things too, weight training, et cetera. Um, and I think all three of us probably agree from our clinical experience, folks who uh, are able to adhere um, are able to tolerate therapy well. Of course, it's on us a little bit to try to identify some of those barriers and get over those humps if needed, but we've got to really try our best to, to help our patients out through this hard time of uh, cancer treatment. One of the number one <clears throat> recommendations I'll give to folks is just a general thing. If you're not moving, start moving. And it, it's interesting to see that philosophy or approach kind of percolating into popular culture. I recently read Peter Atia's book, Outlive, and it really, my main takeaway from that was the importance of exercise and staying physically active in terms of preventing diseases or preventing comorbidities later in life. And I think we're just kind of <laughs> reinventing the wheel sometimes in oncology, but in terms of things patients can do, I think it's a great place to start. Yeah, and I, I just want to I just want to go back to one point Sam made because I, I think another thing, kind of getting away from the preventative uh, aspect of our conversation, but talking about more drug development. I mean, the 
tumor agnostic approval of in her to I mean, what an amazing story. And and I, I think it, it always reminds me that like we we always think we know what we're talking about, but we really don't. You know, I mean, we, we think we know what, how immunotherapies work, but we really don't have the full picture. And I mean, you have a, a company in Daiichi that really redefined a whole tumor you know, type her too low didn't exist before. And, and, and now we're stratifying. So, I mean, it's just interesting to me that, um, you know, old concepts can be recycled as we learn more and, and, um, you know, what's old, what's old and not cool become cool again. You, you know, I, I think it's just, it, it's fascinating because I'm always a little bit humbled by the fact that we don't actually know as much as we think we do. Um, and, and there's a lot more to learn, even just basics um and, and that's a great example but it's such a great approval and, and, and really improving access to care for a lot of patients any big differences there there's always going to be some new treatment target like you mentioned sam or other things being developed but with that in mind kind of reaching the the closing of our discussion any other kind of burning points burning questions either of you would like to leave our viewers with you know, I'll, I'll just, and hopefully I don't sound like a broken record, but I just want to remind the viewers, uh, you know, we are uh, generally in the field of cancer. We're treating patients generally with active cancer, although we participate in survivorship clinics as well. And I just hope that all remember, it's not just on the person who is in the primary care setting to talk about cancer prevention. Um, we've clearly shown several uh, ways we can apply this knowledge uh, in, in the clinic and really for the benefit of our patients who are actively on their cancer journey. So really, take the moment if you have the time available and the resources would be even better but to just maybe spend 30 seconds to a minute of that clinic visit talking about some of these complementary interventions and i hope that your patients will find that they do a lot better when it comes to tolerating cancer related therapies especially for esophageal cancers yeah i would i would i would echo the same thing i think as we're taking care of patients in clinic, you know, it's, it's, uh, unfortunately, we don't have as many organic opportunities to talk to patients about prevention in, in clinic, because they've come to us at a later stage. Uh, but, um, you know, just to echo what Sam said, uh, having patients be as active as possible, if they have barriers to being active in, involving, you know, things like uh, your, your PM&R colleagues, uh, who specialize mm -hmm. in this physical therapy, really focusing on eating, whatever exercise, any of these things can, can really, really help you uh achieve more in terms of treatment and, and, and quality of life and and we've all seen it in in clinic a million times so I, I think it's something that we don't talk about enough um and it's really applicable to everything including esophageal cancer and i think it's something that really can make a huge difference for your patients well great thanks to you both for a lively and engaging discussion i know no doubt there'll be more in the future that comes up with that, thanks again to the viewers, and we will sign off for today. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.